Hey guys, Mike Novogratz here, live from the Bahamas. I'm here at the SALT conference. It's a crypto conference this year, but decided to talk to the master of the universe, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, a pretty special episode, you should tune in. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz, and this is Next with Nova. Mike Novogratz, another episode with Next with Novo here with the great Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm, I'm giving him great just to put a little pressure on him. Uh, Neil, first of all, thanks a lot for doing this. And is it Novogratz? Is that how you pronounce that? Novogratz, like new city in Russia. Dog, Novogratz, thank you for helping me out there. Yeah, doing well, Thank, thanks for asking. All, all, the universe is fine, it's Earth that's messed up, okay? So yeah, just thought I'd make that clear. It okay. really is crazy how messed up our world's getting. Like, so, it so, so it, while I, totally agree. I always try to give myself a cosmic perspective on such conclusions. And then I th thought about it and I said, hmm, if you go from 1939 to 1945 and run the numbers, 1,000 people per hour died in the Second World War. There's nothing like that going on today at all. We're, we're at a place where, you know, if a, tr if a, if a, if a, uh, a car drives into a crowd of protesters and three people die, four people die, that is headlines for a week, okay? And it gets analyzed. It's headlines for a few days internationally, but all week and possibly beyond domestically. Yet somehow we were all okay with a thousand people an hour. It could be because we didn't have the detailed information. It was, well, we take this, this bank or this, I mean, I'm mean, sorry, this, this front or this mountain or this border. And so war was couched in terms of a, uh, the success of strategies rather than human loss. So I'm saying whatever the trials and tribulations of today are, I'd rather live today than in the middle of that war. And or in the middle of the First World War, or in the middle of the 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 Civil War, the, the, the Civil War or the especially <laughs> I'd be someone's servant or slave. There's a whole whole lot in the past I don't need any part of. So give me the present and ideally a future where the arc of progress has continued even further. That's a, that's a fresh perspective. We'll. Are we going to be on Mars one day? <laughs> yeah, but I don't think we're going to call it home. I, I, that seems more. That seems like a remote prospect from where I sit. By the way, there was a day. I don't know how old you are. Maybe we're about the same age. There was a day where the people who didn't think we would get to the moon because they doubted the science and the technology, but then we got to the moon, and then that basically made everything possible. So any any Mars naysayer is not saying it out of doubt that we could do it. They're saying it out of doubt that we would do it because of the, either the cost or the time or you just don't naturally do something that is hugely expensive at high risk with no return on investment. You just don't up and do it unless it's a stunt. And all the rich billionaires could get together and pool their money and do it as a stunt, but that wouldn't make a business model to be emulated in the weeks that followed. Do you have any real interest that, you know, there's all these commercial space flights now, and I'm thinking you're, you know, you're, you're kind of Mr. Universe. Uh, any thoughts of if someone gave you a spot, would you go up and, you know, Jeff Bezos' rocket or Richard Branson's or? Yeah. So if I were to go into anybody's rocket, it would be Elon's rocket because it actually orbits the earth. Okay, the other two, you go up and then you fall back down to earth and you're over and done with in 20 minutes or whatever was the, the time that, yeah. that that involved. They go above the Kármán line where the blue sky disappears and then you see stars in broad daylight, all right? And so that's a, what's called the Kármán line, which is the operational definition of space. But as an astrophysicist, I don't even really want to go into orbit boldly going where hundreds have gone before, I'd rather uh, go somewhere. If I'm going to strap my ass into a rocket, take me to the moon, Mars, and beyond, not just in low Earth orbit. And just for context, just, just let's go through this exercise. 
if you have a schoolroom globe, okay, so it's something the size of a basketball, let's say, and we've all seen them, and there's the color-coded countries on them, I can ask you, first, how far away do you think the moon is from that schoolroom globe? Just uh, off the top of your head, how, how right. far away? The, the wall. <laughs> About the wall? Yeah. So like five feet away, maybe? You know, however yeah. far away. Okay, right. it's 30 feet away. All right, 30 feet. Okay, Mars is a mile away. All right, Bezos and Branson went the thickness of two dimes above Earth's surface. Wow. As an astrophysicist, I can't call that space, even though they technically went above the agreed upon threshold of the Kármán line to, for them to experience what I described. The space station orbits three-eighths of an inch above. So let's, say, let's go into space. I can't feel that as space. Yeah. Not as an astrophysicist. And by the way, Elon went higher than the space station. Okay. He went maybe a centimeter above Earth's surface. So Interesting way to think. That's, what, that's what we're talking about when we say, let's go into space. That's what it means. And that's what, how people have been trained to think about it. And so that's what it is. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. I was, if I go up, I'm going to go on one of the, the ones where you at least got to see the Earth from, a, from a distance. You know? Yeah. And to see the Earth as a sphere, you know, rather than as some huge thing b below you. No, yeah, you want to get some distance on it, get some cosmic perspective. So how did you become this cosmic seeker? You know, your story, you grew up in New York City. Yeah, it's hard. No one in New York City has a relationship with the night sky. This is a rare thing. And that, that could not have happened were it not for a first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. My room in New York City, where I happen to serve as director right now. But that, that, that baptism if you will right i don't know what the sky is you know all my sight lines up i'd land on a building or in smog which was big back then or the 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 light polluted night sky and then boom the lights dim and the stars come out countless thousands of them and i'm all i can say is from that moment on i was star struck i the only way i can explain is that the universe chose me that's amazing i know I was, I, I had no say in the matter. You know, from then on, it took two years to realize you can make a life of it, a career. So, but from age 11, if you ask me that annoying question that adults always ask kids, what, what question is that? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? I, I had an answer and it was astrophysicist. That pretty much shut him up, you know? Because if you said, I want to be a lawyer or a doctor, oh, Aunt Matilda's a lawyer, Uncle Lenny's a doctor or whatever, and, but no one knew any astrophysicists, so it was a pretty short conversation, typically. You know, I remember when I graduated college, I went to flight school. It was down in Alabama, and, and learning to fly at night, the, they would drop you off in a field and take the other pilot for an hour, and you got to lay in this field. And I remember listening to Beethoven on a Walkman back then, and laying down, and you could see every star in the damn universe down there because there was no lights for miles. No lights, no lights. That's the big, the big um, thief of beautiful night skies or city lights, basically. And by the way, that's a relatively modern thing. You know, when cities didn't get electrified until like 1910, 1920, and before then there were gas lamps, which are not creating light pollution with whatever other kind of pollution they're creating. It's not light. So, by the way, what, so what, uh, what, Beethoven composition were you listening to? I you know, the, the, the fifth. The fifth that, symphony, that, that, okay. The symphony. It yeah, was, the it, fourth and fifth movements, I mean, the third and fourth movements are uh, undervalued relative to the first movement, but I think they're the best, some of his best composition, the third and fourth movement. It's highly energetic, it's highly varied, um, and it's joyous. And so, yeah, no, I'm, me, Beethoven, in the night sky, have gone together for a long time. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, it's funny. I was thinking of my. I, I used to read books all the time. I used to listen to symphonies and classical music all the time when I was in literally Bumfuck, Alabama. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now I'm in New York City, and it's all right there. And it's, you know, you really got to make an effort to to think about it. You know, go to uh -huh. go to the symphony. Funny how that works. So you wrestled. That's yeah. That's mostly what I love you for. <laughs> oh, are you a wrestler? I was a wrestler. I wrestled at Princeton, actually. Oh, cool. Uh, what, what weight class? 150 pounds. Oh, skinny boy. Yeah, okay. 
a lot skinnier back then. <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, the weight class that 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 maximized strength, agility, and speed was like 167. Right. So you would at that weight class, you could see a muscle pin as likely as some something sort of. I don't want to call it, quite call it acrobatic, but something nimble that a nimble body would do. As you got heavier than that, yeah. the guys get slower and a little more more lumbery, and and lighter than that, there are no interesting body throws or anything. So, so I've always been intrigued by the 167 category, but I was 190 pounds, um, and at in the day that was the highest weight category before you wrestled unlimited. Yeah. So I, I had really good incentive to make weight on that. <laughs> <laughs> and did you wrestle in New York City high school wrestling? Yeah, yeah. So I was I was captain of my high school team, undefeated in high school. But high school. And then I then I got to college, and then and and I was, this is New York City. But then I went right. to college, and then I started wrestling the, the boys from the Midwest, like corn fed. <laughs> There's a whole other kind of wrestler. These. Yeah. They must have been, you know, hauling calves, you know, on their back, you know, on the farm. That, so this it was a whole other thing. And I was delighted. Uh, so I had a losing record. I was delighted just to see such great talent. Uh, I had a losing record until my senior year. And but I enjoyed the sport so much. And I didn't have any ego invested in it, you know. So it was just when you lose, you lose, right? That's all it is to it. And you just got to get it better. Painfully so, right? Yeah, yeah, you can't pass that one off. And I had a hypothesis that has never been, been, I'm yet to find an exception to this. So we get to use you as this example, okay? So my question to you is, um, of all the people I've asked, what is the hardest sport they've ever done? You'll get all manner of answers. You'll get cross-country skiing, rowing, um, triathlon, uh, you know, there's all manner of, if they have ever wrestled, the answer is wrestling. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt. You know? So you agree with this? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. There's, and I have rode and I have done and I have run, not, not marathons, but I have, you know, I've run the mile uh, and yes, they're tiring, but there's nothing like the end of an eight minute wrestling match where one time. I was so tight, I couldn't hold my pee. The, the, the muscles necessary for continence were used up in the wrestling match, okay? <laughs> okay. I've been there, trust me. Yeah. You know, I, was, I was just downstairs and I was right in the next wrestler and he was asking if I still wrestle. I said, well, yeah, I broke this finger in my last match against Jesse Jansen. <laughs> oh, really? Jesse, Harvard well, guy. we know Jesse. That yeah. wasn't a bar. It was a barroom wrestling match. Yeah. Oh, that's different. I okay. Lost hearing, I lost hearing in my right ear wrestling my son. I had got what they called sudden hearing loss. But are you supposed to stop this? What are you doing? Just no. I'm not giving. No. There's no sympathy here. Okay. No. Fifty-seven <laughs> probably had enough. <laughs> and some guy looked at me weird at the bar, so I had to wrestle him. And <laughs> it's like that's supposed to stop. All right. Just in case nobody told you. Damn. No, but so I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I was in really good shape. But I was in slightly better shape when I also danced. I was on a performing member on three different dance companies. So I had the strength and the agility from wrestling, and the dance gave me a grace and a sense of, of poise, grace, and, and, and that, sort of elegance. Very, that's something very few wrestlers have a lot of. Grace? You watch wrestlers on the dance floor. It's not what you'd call graceful. <laughs> Yeah, so I um, those are fond memories that I have. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's great to hear. And so here's a question for you, right? You've spent so much time explaining the universe to young people, to old people, to all of us. Now we have this thing called the metaverse, which is, you can define it however you want, where people are creating their own universe in this virtual world. Uh, do you think about how that will impact how we think about the real universe, or is there is there anything there, or is that just me making a question up? <laughs> well, there are video games where you can create universes. Is that the one you're talking about? Otherwise, there's the multiverse, right. which is where the idea that there are multiple universes in addition 
to ours. Where, and if there's an infinite number of them, then all combinations of molecules and events will take place. So there could be one where I have your podcast and you are me, except you have an evil mustache or goatee or whatever. <laughs> There'd be one little twitch in it, but everything else is the same. Um, so there's, there's, there's cogent, authentic reasons for thinking there's a multiverse out there. There real that because I, I saw the Spider Man movie and I kind of chuckled. But you think there are real reasons to think that could happen? Yeah, yeah, and that, I, and it's not an accident that it's worked its way into the Marvel universe. Of course, there's an upcoming film if it's not already out, um, Doctor Strange, mul Madness in the Multiverse or something. They're, they're doing a, an alliteration on the M, and once again, it's invoking the multiverse. Now, of course, Doctor Strange can move through what are basically wormholes. They look like portals, but they're, they're wormholes. He can move from one time and place to another time and place with his magic sort of Tibetan uh, powers, you know, wax on, wax off powers. But uh, all they're recreating there are, are wormholes, which it technically is no different from the Tesseract in the Thor um, series, where he moves through the realm through the Tesseract and coming in and out. So these are all ways to move through time and space. Interesting. Well, we, you know, like I, I used to love watching Star Trek. I still do even the, the new versions of it. Uh, and it's amazing how science fiction has led us, you know, you're like from the Jetsons to Star Trek. Are, are we hundreds of years off from traveling through time and space? You mean, um, you, you mean traveling via wormholes and warp drives and that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Personally, I think it's never, but <laughs> but uh, maybe you shouldn't get future advice from me. I'll tell you why. All right, I saw the original Star Trek in real time. That's how old I am, and I remembered seeing that. Okay, warp drives, I got it. Uh, photon torpedoes, sure. Phasers, sure. Got all that, uh, and. Then they walk up to a door and the door just knows they're there and it opens automatically. And I said, no, that'll never happen. I remember <laughs> thinking that was the least believable thing to me in Star Trek was the <laughs> auto open door. And at the time, they didn't really exist. Some supermarkets had pressure pads outside because you'd be holding groceries and things. And so you'd step on that and that would open the door. But th there was no pad. I looked. There was no pad that they were stepping on. So how could the door know you're there? How could, can't know? And so, yeah, don't take future advice from me. That's funny. So the other big kind of advancement that I think in the last five years is really the acceptance of psychedelics, right? You know, with Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, seemed to make it okay. Uh, and now they're everywhere, right? Recreationally, uh, for, for mental health, so if it's LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca or all these ego dissolution drugs, which puts you in some wild state of the universe. Like if you've never been on an ayahuasca journey, you literally are in a different plane, different planet. And so has that s seeped into your universe yet? My personal universe or professionally? What do you... Professionally, I would. Yeah, I would... So, all right. So here's, I have some a very simple response to that question, okay? The human brain barely works at all. <laughs> barely works. You get 10 people to describe the same event that happens in front of them, and you get 10 different accounts of it. You, there are books that are, that are optical illusions is the line longer or shorter? I don't know. Oh my gosh! Is the thing? Is the vase? Is it a vase or is it a face? Is it a? Is it? Is it? In, and these are simple line drawings that your brain can't even figure out. Our 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 sensory system barely works. The methods and tools of science have been developed to basically replace our senses with reliable tools and reliable sensors, all right? So that when you report something, it has a chance of being accurate. Now what you wanna do is add chemicals to the brain 
and stir. Okay, I don't have a problem with that, but don't come up to me and assert that you are now closer to an objective reality in this world. <laughs> because the brain barely worked to begin with. Okay? So, you may be tripping. You go whatever trip you want. But if at the end of the day, you'll say, you know, I visited the center of a black hole and now I have a new hypothesis and I'm going to write it down and that's going to end up to be true because I was actually there. If that started happening, I'll take notice and I'll line up for the dose. <laughs> but until that happens, I am skeptical that it will help me do anything because I'm trying hard to assess the objective realities of that which is sitting right in front of me and that's hard enough that's that it's your guy I, I would admit when i was on an ayahuasca mission the shaman sitting in front of me he would just be black smoke and i'd be like i know there's a man there but i'm just seeing black smoke your brain really <laughs> does play tricks on you <laughs> right and the thing is since your brain is your only awareness of your of existence you want to believe that it's real you you want to believe that and uh, I have a very simple example. I didn't do this with all the drugs you listed, but I remember when I first started writing, um, I preferred to write by hand first and then transfer it to computer. Just, I was, I was a little old fashioned part of me. And I remember reading about Hemingway and, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. They always had a drink in their hand. You know, I thought, okay, let me try that. I don't like hard liquor, so I had some wine. So I always had some wine there some nice wine and i'd be writing i say yeah yeah it's flowing yeah that's this is a this is a it's a trope but it's real and then i did the experiment two years later i said i will write the same amount but with no drink at all it was not nearly as fun but then i looked at the two side by side there was no comparison okay the non-alcohol induced writing was vastly superior to the ones that I wrote when I was uh, drinking glasses of wine, even though my brain told me it was better. That's interesting. And so, so, I, so based on that experiment, no, I'm not going to say I'm a little tipsy now. This is loosening up extra thoughts. So now I'll write more fluidly. That's not how, it's not, at least not how it worked with me. And let me take that a step further and say, imagine how much better a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Hemingway would have been without the drinks or without the, what, the whatever. Less colorful stories, but maybe a better writer. You're right. <laughs> no doubt. So let me go back to your life a little bit. So you've had this kind of magical life in lots of ways, right? You get to represent, teach the universe. Give us like, give me three highlights. When you look back and you're like, I can't believe I got to do that. Like, what are some of the things that you look back and kind of pinch yourself? People you've met, places you've gone. Yeah, so a couple of things. That's, that's, uh, thanks for that question. So one of them was simply earning, earning the PhD. So I was asked to give the commencement speech at the convocation where the PhDs were awarded. This is at Columbia University. And that was, when I was 11 years old, I said my life's goal is the PhD. That's what I said. I want to be an astrophysicist, uh, get a PhD. So that was the fulfillment of a lifelong quest up until that point. And the final line, by the way, this speech I think is on, online somewhere, but the final sentence was, I have lived and fulfilled the dream, yet I know my life has only just begun. And so that was a proscenium through which I crossed. Maybe. And I knew that whatever happened then, it would just be gravy. It almost didn't matter. Uh, it would just be fun because the, the effort to get the PhD was where the, where the struggle is and you learn what to do and how to do it and how to think and how to be wired and get all the right math and all of that. So that was a high point for me. And, and being the one who gave the commencement speech asked by the provost to do so. Uh, so that's one highlight, I would say. Another highlight was... Um, I, uh, well, there's, there's several, I mean, not including family highlights, you know, when my kids are born, right? That's, uh, those, that's kind of an obvious high point, at least for me, when you realize, oh my gosh, 
they would completely depend on me for not dying for the next three years of their life, first of all. So, so your role in the world shifts when, you know, because through the toddler years, they can kill themselves in any number of a hundred ways. But then you want to make sure they're enlightened. And uh, my wife and I assured ourselves, and I worked towards this fact that whatever that would be their interests, they would be scientifically literate going into it. And I certified them scientifically literate by the time they were like 13. Certified. At that point, I didn't care what grades they got. I didn't care what they majored in. I didn't care what college they went to because I knew they would never be exploited by anyone because they knew what science is, how and why it worked, and how to find out what was true and what was not about the world around them. So if, if they were at a table, this is at age 13, 14, they're at a table and there's a grown-up that says, you know, Murky was in retrograde today and I wasn't feeling good. They'll say, um, what is it about Mercury in retrograde that is, is affecting you? <laughs> okay. And they would start asking questions. They wouldn't say, you idiot. No, they would just ask questions to try to probe. And that's the, that's the right thing to do, okay? To get in there and find out. And so that's how I knew we're, I'm good. I'm done raising them. They can raise themselves from here. So I, I, that's, I, I, that's I, I, an important, uh, that's stretched over time, of course, but this was a high point in ensuring that this would be a fundamental part of their character and their identity. Uh, I'd say another point was I was invited to have dinner with Barack Obama. And it was a small dinner, eight people up in the White House residence. And that's I learned why the Lincoln bedroom is called the Lincoln bedroom. Do you know why it's called the Lincoln bedroom? I don't. Okay. There is a handwritten copy of the Gettysburg Address in a display case there from Abraham Lincoln. So wow. it's the Lincoln bedroom. There that's, it is. So that was fun. a high point because I thought, you know, uh, you know I'm, I don't generally care who's famous or who isn't, but it was an affirmation that I was doing enough things in my life to be valued by a highly important person who may need that advice or seek it or or embrace it and so uh, by the way it was a dinner with jean it was not a state dinner it was uh we were told to come in jeans he was in jeans you know 9 30 comes around 10 o'clock and the daughters come home from the movies you know because they live there right they live in the, that's the house the white house the upstairs right so um, so that was, uh, it was, it was affirmation for me. Did you grow maybe, up? Maybe I'm doing something right. What's that? Did you grow up working class, middle class, upper middle, middle class? class? Middle class. Middle class. Um, and so I, I didn't have to worry where my food was coming from or, you know, whether we, we would be destitute or where my clothing was going to come from. Um, and so uh, my mother was resourceful. She was a housewife through empty nest and then went to college and then went to graduate school that was by prior arrangement so wow. that she would be raising the children at home and she would be at home when we got home from school and uh my earliest memory was, were in housing projects in the east bronx the castle hill housing projects um uh, near the uh, whitestone bridge is over right. there and then my father's income went above that level because you, your income constricted right. to stay in either low income or middle income housing parts. So it went above that. So then we moved to Riverdale, which is a, a, a swanky part of the That's Bronx. Fancy. is a fancy part of the Bronx. And so my, a lot of my formative years were in Riverdale, going to the rest of my elementary school there, middle school. And then I went, of course, to the Bronx High School of Science. So you're a Bronx science. Got it. Yeah, so yeah. You're still and a good people, wrestling team. I like saying that just because it's an interesting fact that Bronx High School of Science counts eight Nobel laureates among its graduates. Wow. It's eight. Wow. And that's as many as the total number of Nobel Prizes in the country of Spain. Okay. So I'm just, I'm fascinated by that fact. It's not just a simple statistical fluctuation. There's something real going on. It could be the water supply. I think that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a crazy stat. One out of 300 Americans is in the New York City public school system today. 
Well, that's interesting. So we have a million. So that's one. Yes, yeah, three hundred yeah. million people. Right. So there you have it. Right. Yes, yeah, a, a quick division. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. When you think of it that way, like you know, New York City system is so big. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, and it's a shame there. Are, I don't know seven or eight really great schools, and then the. Well, yeah. well. So what's going on there? Yeah. So maybe the eight Nobel prizes are not so impressive. If you just have a system that collects the most motivated kids out of a million kids at any given moment and puts them in one place, then you're going to, if so, yeah, it's eight out of millions and millions and millions of kids yeah. who, um, who achieve this. So uh, maybe it's not as impressive as I'm trying to make it out to sound. No, it's still impressive because it's one okay. school with <laughs> teachers and a roof and you're mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, uh, there's something there. Yeah. No doubt about it. So let me get to another point that drives me crazy right now. And I'm sure it drives you a little crazy as a science guy. You know, we've had this deterioration in trust and in truth and in science, kind of an anti-intellectual movement that has showed up in the country where people say, well, I don't know what the truth is. And you're like, dude, it's, you know, if it's global warming or there, there are plenty of issues, voter fraud, uh, how do you process that and then try to help yeah it's it's hard it's a hard question and a hard answer uh i can only poke at the monster right i don't know that i have a solution to bring it down but um this dovetails to elon musk buying twitter and what is he going to do next is he going to open all the free speech floodgates that would then require or necessitate that trump gets his his mouthpiece back on twitter and so for me, uh, I think Twitter, if you suppress someone who, in a free speech world who s believes they have something to say, then they will always be able to say, I had something to say, but they prevented me from saying it. They'll get to say that to the grave. But suppose instead you gave them the platform and then you just had a louder platform, a more true platform, a more believable platform. Then people just tune them out, these other folks. They don't listen to them. They ignore them. And so now no one is listening to you, but you can't say because someone um, uh, muzzled you. The, the only response there is your arguments did not win out in the public square. And so deal with it. So the challenge then is going back into the school system. Do people know what objective truth is? No, they're not taught it. To them, science is just memorize these bold faced words in the, you know, in the chapter and you'll get. Whereas science is a way of querying nature. Yes satchel's effects are aspects of it but that's not the most important feature the most important feature is how do we use science to decide and decode what is true and what is not how do we use the methods and tools of science to ensure that what you think is true is actually true and what you know to not be true is actually not true this is what science does. It empowers you to be able to distinguish that. And not enough people have that training. So, no, I can't run around, beat people on the head as adults if they didn't have that background. You know, if you say the earth is flat, do I get angry with you or do I get sad about the educational system that trains you? And as an educator, I tend to look to the educational system. I was in Congress, uh, I forgot, why but i'm there and i'm meeting with members of the house science committee and one of the members of the house science committee i forgot what state he was from some state in the south he's a young earth creationist to him the earth is six thousand years old and he's serving on the science committee <laughs> okay now i don't mind you thinking earth is six thousand years old but if you have power over science in the country that that's dangerous that's like the unraveling of a hard earned foundation for how and why civilization works at all in terms of the technologies that we all depend on point is 
I could have grabbed him by the lapel and say, how could you think this? But then I realized he's representing a voting district. So if he thinks that way, his voters probably think that way. So as an educator, my obligation is not to him because his obligation is to the voters. My obligation as an educator is to the voters. Right. Yeah. And so, so that's how I think about this. And yeah, we don't, you know, when was the printing press invented? Middle 15th century. It took 150 years, maybe, before they figured out how to um, report news, right? They did the obvious thing. They printed books because they were handwritten labors of monks, right? So is there anything else we can do with the printing press? Let's look around. Oh, let's print news, all right? The internet is how old? Uh, sorry, the uh, social media is how old? 15 years right. old, tops? 15, right. Plus or minus? I don't know that we have instant solutions immediately. I, I still wouldn't trade the internet for not the internet. So maybe we just need to think harder about how to get it to work. When we invented cars, people were dying in the streets, getting hit by cars. Yeah. Cars get hit in other things, killing the passengers in the car and the driver. We could have said, let's get rid of the cars. But no, we knew the car had some value. So let's invent traffic lights. Yeah. Oh, now think about a traffic light. It's got three lights. I think the original ones might have only had stop and go, but still, there's a lot going on in a traffic light, right? That somebody had to invent. And so it gets invented. And then you have crosswalks, and then you have rules, and then you have lanes, and you have, go look at those early uh, 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 video of, you know, San Francisco, New York, there's no lanes, you know, the horse and buggy goes wherever they got to go. And now you're going to put an automobile there and you have no lanes. So you fix the problem. So I think it's a fixable problem. And maybe we have to come in from before you even enter the social media world. So that when you do, you have the defensive and offensive capabilities to protect yourself from misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, no, that's. It's a, it's a generational challenge. It really is uh, because you just see it everywhere. I mean, part of, you know, I, I spent a lot of my time in cryptocurrency blockchain and blockchain is a way of trying to mathematically validate trust because people aren't trusting anymore. You know, like we don't, it's, it's amazing the brain act of trust. And so maybe there's, there's some solutions that the blockchain will be able to help with. Not all. Yeah, by the way, we also maybe need some more civics right a lot more if you think the way to you know is to invade the capital and you're a citizen of the united states and and somehow that's the you believe that's the right thing to do something's wrong something's missing from our educational background that i mean i had civics i didn't think it was as useful as it perhaps could have been but nonetheless it was a thing all right you learned about the Congress and the House of Representatives and the and the and it's uh, you know and the power the seats of power the, the legislative the legal and the and the executive branch you learn about all this and how it works and 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 why we should value it even cherish it and so yeah this is all just poking at the monster yeah <laughs> we got a lot of poking to do there is a lot of poking to do. Uh, well, listen, I appreciate your poking, certainly. Okay. <laughs> you know, someone needs to, when you sit, listen, you sit in a really interesting perch where, you know, people believe you because you're on TV. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I don't want you to believe me because I said it. No. Again, I want, I want you to believe me because I convinced you yeah. of how to think about the problem that then you take ownership of your own, uh, of you having found the truth for yourself. It's the ownership. So people say, how do you want to be remembered? You want to stay? No, I don't need to be remembered. If I'm remembered, that means I mattered more than what I taught. And that should never be the case. That's cult building. All right. And I'm, I don't need any. No, I don't need it at all. Just find me in the Bahamas <laughs> when all this is done. <laughs> so you're, you know, I always think we go through life in chapters. So you're a few years older than me, I'm guessing. Uh, you're probably 1976 grad. Yes. 
Good guess. Uh, of high school. Of high school. Okay, yes. so 79 college, right? Eighty um, college. I took four years 80, in college. 80 college, right, right. It must be like four. Um, <laughs> right, so seven years. So 60, 64, 65. Uh, what's the next chapter? Of what? Just what you're going to do. You're oh, my gonna... life. Oh, sure. Sure. So, yeah, I do think of my life in chapters, by the way. So when I was dancing, that was a chapter. And people say, why don't you go on Dancing with the Stars? Oh, you know, okay, I see what you did there. <laughs> but no, because I don't, I used to dance and I don't dance anymore. So I'm just not. Uh, and also, if I can add a bit of wisdom here, uh, let's say you were in high school and you were a high school quarterback and you threw the winning touchdown for the final game and people carried you off the field and you're homecoming king and you do all of this and there's a photo of you making that winning touchdown. Okay. And it's on the mantle. Um, if you then start life, but don't continue to accrue achievements, then that singular moment begins to weigh more and more on your own self-identity. And in the end, I don't think that's a good thing. Because then you'll remember, well, I used to be in shape. I'm not anymore. I used to have everyone love me. Now they yell at me. I used to have. And so all of a sudden that becomes th this metric against which you're comparing the rest of your life. And there's no chance the rest of your life will compare with that because that was singular. So what you do instead is every set of years create some goals that are not retreading a previous goal, a brand new goal. All right, now I'm going to travel the world if you have the resources to do so or I'm going to build something, or I'm going to whatever. Just do something that you hadn't done before. Now you, the book you're writing of your life has chapters. Now you can look back and turn, I remember then, that's great. I don't wish I was still doing it because now I'm doing something else. So for me going forward, I have a book coming out. I have a book that just came out this week. I have a book coming out in the fall and then two other books I want to write then I want to go to the Bahamas. Okay. I'm, in the, but, I'm actually in the Bahamas I, my, right now. I, I, oh, you're in the Bahamas right now? Yep. Okay. So Beautiful save landing. a spot for me, okay, <laughs> on the beach. So the uh, so I have this fantasy, however delusional, that in a few years there will be enough people like me, not like me, but doing what I'm doing on this landscape of science and education and pop culture that I can slowly step backwards and exit the back door and no one will notice because there's so many other people, YouTubers and Instagrammers and TikTokers and, and, and podcasters all bringing the latest, most interesting things about science to you, boosting the science literacy of culture. And at that point, I will not be necessary and I'm delighted to go back to the lab and and go down to the bahamas i like that i like that i saw uh, pictures from the, the webb telescope is it the james james webb telescope is that the i had they have pictures yet i haven't seen them if they have they were just spectacular mm -hmm. um, and so what it reminded me though is we don't get enough of that like in our normal day like again you're talking yeah, about by the way, when hubble came around it was a precisely timed when everyone started getting an internet account uh, you know, an email account, and everyone had a desktop computer. And so practically everyone's screensaver and, and, and wallpaper was a Hubble image. And so, and Hubble was around for like 30 years. So entire generations of people came of age connected to the glory of the cosmos. And so we need another one of those rounds as we go forward. Yeah, I the, think. The, the, the pictures I saw were literally, they looked like almost paintings. I was mm. like, this is spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing what science does and yeah. you know, like how they built that thing. And, and so pretty awesome. Well, Dale, I don't take too much time. I really appreciate you sprinkling us with wisdom. Uh, I love what everything you're doing. Uh, and so. And sorry to hear about your latter day wrestling injuries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I figured it keeps you tough. Uh, it is no, no, see, this is what I'm saying. You had your peak and now later on you're thinking you can still do it and you can't. No. You should be doing something else. That's true. That's okay. True. I actually think of that way. I, I think.
think of my life in chapters as well. But every once in a while, I just the, that Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> anyway, thanks a ton. We All right. look forward to your books. And, Thank you. Uh, I love the fact that you're the voice of uh, the universe on uh, Maloka. My wife. Oh, oh yeah, you. Oh, thank you for noticing that. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of voices, in the current book, which is "Welcome to the Universe in 3D," did, did I say this at the beginning? I don't remember. Nope. Where uh, it's you enabled it. You're seeing objects in the universe in full 3D. There's like viewers. There's a viewer as part of the structure of the book. Um, and so it's like the the moon nebulae, the constellations, where you see them spread in the three dimensions as they actually are, rather than the constellations on a inner dome that you think it is right. right so there's a lot of sort of mind popping uh, awareness but there's a website welcome to the universe.net which has these the whole book series in there including the 3d book and in it if there's bonus features i narrate the captions of each of those the captions are there in the book but I'll, if you hit the button it's then i narrate it for you and i put in my best planetarium voice <laughs> welcome to the universe so so that, that my planetarium voice carries you through the book so that's a little we figured we we that was a last minute decision i said no i want to go to the bahamas no you're going to narrate this and there was like 10 days before the book was released are they so, are these books written for 14 year olds 20 year olds any age what do you think about as your audience oh i think i write for adults but uh you know precocious um, I, uh, teenagers, you know, middle schoolers yeah. can typically read it, but I, I, I my, the vocabulary I use assumes you're an adult. Got it. And the referencing that I make, I'll reference baseball or football or, or right. politics because that's part of the pop culture scaffold that helps me bring the material to the public. So, yeah. Love it. All right, guys. Another Hi, episode dude. with Max with Novo Neil. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Take well. care. Bye.